I want you to type into Google either now or sometimes later, does neuroscience show we don't have free will? I almost guarantee you're going to find a whole bunch of articles suggesting that neuroscience has at long last definitively shown that we don't have free will. In this video, I'm going to talk you through one of the main studies that often get cited when people try and argue that neuroscience has shown we don't have free will. And then I'm going to suggest to you why I think that that experiment doesn't show that we don't have free will. Let's get started. The most famous experiment that gets started in conversations about neuroscience and free will is an experiment run by Benjamin Libet and his colleagues in 1983. And here's how the experiment works. So you can look this up, Libet et al, 1983. You'll find it. It's all over the internet. Here's how the experiment worked. First thing, subjects in the experiment were hooked up to an EEG machine. If you've ever seen uh, somebody with uh, the cap on their heads that's measuring electrical waves, that's an EEG machine. So their brain waves are getting measured. Second, they're instructed to sit at a chair and whenever they want to, to press a lever. So you can imagine them. They're sitting at this table and they've got a little lever in front of them and whenever they want, they press that lever. And they do this for several minutes. Whenever they want, press the lever. Third thing that's getting measured, while they're pressing the lever and while that EEG cap is on their heads, they're also watching a clock in front of them. And the clock is going like this. It's going fairly quickly in a circle. And what they're asked to do is they're asked to say, whenever you feel like pressing the lever, let me know where that clock was at. So you can imagine these people. They're pressing the lever. They're watching the clock. It's actually kind of hard to do this. Um, but you know, try making a circle with one hand and pressing a lever with the other. So they're, they're pressing this lever, they're watching the clock, and they're saying, oh, I felt like pressing the lever that time when it was on the six. No, that time it was on the nine. Okay, so you get the idea, right? So what can the experimenters gather? They can gather three really important pieces of data. First, they can gather the moment at which people press the lever. Second, they can gather data about when these people felt like they wanted to press the lever. Remember, they're, pointing the time, they're reporting the time at which they felt like they wanted to press it. And third, they're gathering brain waves directly from participants' brains. So what does Libet find? Well, what they find is that there's this very famous brain wave called a readiness potential. And readiness potentials are a brain wave that starts to rise, right? So you can imagine sort of a, a picture of a brain wave here. Um, you know, they kind of, these, these waves like that, that go up and down. And a readiness potential starts to rise before motor action, and then peaks right when you perform a motor action. And sure enough, Libet finds that precisely when this wave comes to the top of the wave, that's when people are pressing the lever. So that's totally consistent. You've got this brain wave, and whenever the brain wave gets to the top, that's precisely when people are pushing the lever. What else do they find? They find that this readiness potential starts to rise precisely when they, they find the, leisure, the, the readiness potential starts to rise right around a half a second before it gets to the top. So right around a half a second before they press the lever is when the readiness potential starts to rise. Third thing they find is only about a quarter of a second, about halfway into that wave, is where people decide that they want to push the lever. So you can imagine this readiness potential, right? It's coming along. It starts to rise about a half a second before you push the lever. Then about a quarter second later, the person thinks, oh, I want to push the lever. Then another quarter second later, they push the lever and the readiness potential starts to come down again. How does Libet and his colleagues interpret these findings? Here's how. They interpret them by saying that when the readiness potential starts to rise, that's when your brain has decided to push the lever. It's only a quarter second later, again, as this readiness potential is rising, that you become aware that you want to push the lever, and a quarter second after that, that you actually push the lever. How to understand this? Well, according to Libet et al., what has happened is your brain has decided to push the lever before you do. Your brain decides to push the lever, and only about a quarter second later do you catch up with your brain and decide, oh, I want to push the lever now. But if your brain decides to push your lever before you decide and are aware that you want to push the lever, 
Well then, it looks like, on the surface at least, that you didn't choose to push the lever. Rather, your brain decided to do that for you. And if that's true, well, Libet et al. argue there is no free will. And in fact, that is what they argue. And when, again, if you go on Google and you look up, does neuroscience show that we don't have free will? That's what a lot of other folks pick up on too. That this experiment showing that our brain decides to do things before we do shows definitively once and for all, there is no free will. Now I wanna suggest to you for two reasons, that's a hasty conclusion. First reason, before we can decide what free will, whether there is free will, we first have to decide what free will is. And I want to suggest to you that that's a very, very difficult project. In fact, sorting out exactly what we mean by free will is something that philosophers, both those who have agreed with free will and those that don't agree with free will, have debated for thousands of years. And the plot thickens. Here's why. Certain accounts of free will are totally compatible with your brain deciding to do things before you do. Here's just one example. Example. The philosopher A.J. Ayer defended an account of free will, according to which all it takes for us to be free is that no one is forcing us to do something. So as long as no one's forcing me to push the lever, then I'm perfectly free to push the lever. It doesn't matter then on Ayer's account of free will if my brain has somehow caused me to push the lever. All that matters for Ayer is that no one is forcing me to push the lever. So for Ayer, I'm free when I push the lever, regardless of whether my brain decided to do it for me or if I decided to do it for myself. Now, that's not to defend Ayer's account of free will. All that's to say is that on some accounts of free will, your brain deciding to do things before you do might show that you don't have free will. But on other accounts, it doesn't. What does that mean? It means that before we decide whether neuroscience can show we don't have free will, we first have to determine what we mean by free will. On some accounts of free will, neuroscience maybe does show we don't have it, but on others, it definitively doesn't. The question, however, of how we understand what free will is and how we define free will is a distinctively philosophical one. So what does this show? Well, it shows that before we decide whether neuroscience shows we don't have free will, we first have to do some philosophy of free will to see what exactly the science does show and what it doesn't. Second problem with concluding from Libet's experiment that we don't have free will, that's that Libet shows at most, and ex most experiments like this, so you could do a more digging um, and, and look at different experiments that have purported to show that we don't have free will. Um, nearly all of these experiments look at free will in association with very simple motor actions, things like pushing a button, pushing a lever. And more, most of the time, too, people are instructed simply to push the lever or push the button whenever they feel like it. So suppose then that these experiments did show that those kinds of actions our brain decides to do before we do. That our brain sort of gears up, starts this readiness potential before we become consciously aware of wanting to perform the action. Let's just give them that. Let's suppose that the experiments do show that. Again, I've given some reasons to be doubtful why I think that that shows anything about free will, or at least we need to do some philosophy before deciding that. But suppose we give them that. In that case, the most that those experiments show are that there is no free will in a certain kind of action. In particular, a very simple motor action that's chosen relatively spontaneously and relatively in a split second, right? I wanna push the lever now. I wanna push the button now. Okay, well, maybe that's something. But here's what's interesting. When most of us think about free will, that's not the kind of action we mean. When I think, when do I most clearly exert my free will? Well, you would think it's when I decide to join or leave a religion. It's when I decide to declare a major at college. It's when I decide I want to move to this city or when I want to take this job. It's not like simple motor spontaneous actions that we think that are the most important kinds of free actions. It's rather big life decisions that we think are the most important kinds of free actions. And I want to suggest to you that Libet and all the other neuroscience that purports to show we don't have free will concentrates on these simple motor actions 
And even if they're successful in showing that those aren't free, that doesn't have much of anything to do with whether the big life decisions kinds of free actions, the ones in fact that are actually important to us, whether those aren't free. So those are two reasons then why I think that neuroscience doesn't show that we ha don't have free will. Number one, we have to determine what free will is before we can say that anything shows we don't have it. And number two, because most of the neuroscience has concentrated on very simple, spontaneous motor actions and not the kind of free actions that actually matter to us and mean something to us. Now, does this show that we do have free will? No. Everything I've discussed today merely shows that neuroscience hasn't, I don't think, solved the question for us. Now, as a Christian, as a theist, I do believe we have free will. That's a really important part of my overall metaphysical outlook of what the world's like and what we as human beings are like, that we really do make our own choices, that we are free in those choices, that God has created us as free beings. But none of what I've said today shows that that's the case. Rather, what I've tried to show is that whether we have free will has not by any means been settled by neuroscience. The question of free will is absolutely still one that's up for debate, and even up for debate in the 21st century, an era of neuroscience. Thanks a lot for your attention.